uh, first timer on Truth and Liberty and a new friend. His name is Mark Meckler. And uh, Mark is one of these guys behind the scenes that has done so much to revitalize the conservative movement in America. Um, he's actually the president of an organization called Convention of States Foundation and Convention of States Action. Convention of States, it's like, what? what is that? Are you actually wanting to scrap the United States Constitution? How could you do such a thing? But that's really not what you're doing. Can you kind of tell us what it's about? The federal government had 17 enumerated powers when we began. Today, the, those powers number in the tens of thousands. It was never intended to be this way. And so the question is, what do you do if we agree the federal government's out of control, the debt's out of control? These guys stay in D.C. and they were never meant to stay in D.C. There's a couple of choices. One is we could ask them to give us our power back. <laughs> They're never going to do that. No tyranny has ever returned power that it has accumulated to itself in all of human history. And so the question is, what do you do? And the framers gave us in Article 5 a method for the states and the people to rise up and to go around Congress and around the president and restrain federal overreach. And that's by calling a convention of states. Uh, we have 27 amendments to the United States Constitution. Um, and all of those amendments were originally approved by Congress and then submitted to the states for ratification. Right. We've never used the convention. So the Article 5 has that option for amending where it gets passed by Congress, two thirds majority, and then ratified by the states. But so no one, most average American doesn't know about this option, but Article 5 also says the states can come together and have a convention to propose amendments. Is, you know, people want term limits. People want mm -hmm. a balanced budget amendment. People want the federal government to quit messing around in our private lives, in our personal lives, in our property, in our families, in our education systems. And the federal government, Congress itself, is never going to propose amendments which restrict their own power, their ability to spend, their own terms. So if we believe that those things are necessary, we're going to have to do that ourselves. And the process put forth was suggested on September 15, 1787, by Colonel George Mason. They're in convention, drafting the Constitution. It's two days before the end of convention, Mason stands up, says there's a problem. We gave the power to Congress, but not to the people acting through the states. And he asks, are we really so naive that we believe that a federal government, which is a tyranny, will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? Interestingly, Richard, there's no debate. Madison's notes say NINCOM, which was Latin abbreviation for no comment. And there, it's unanimously adopted to give us this power. And the way the power works, it's the same as Congress. It takes two thirds of Congress to propose an amendment. It takes two thirds of the states just to agree to get into a convention. And they have to agree on what the subject matter is. And once they get in convention, it takes 26 states to agree to propose an amendment. And when they do, that amendment is just a suggestion. And then it has to go out to the states for the same ratification method that Congress uses. You need three quarters or 38 of the states to agree to ratify anything before it becomes part of the Constitution. Mm. And human nature tells us that people like power and we accumulate power. And when we have power, we don't like to give up power. Uh, and this is just the story of all humankind. And so the idea that Congress itself is going to say, you know what, we'll, we'll just stop spending so much money. Or, you know what, we don't love being here in D.C. enough. And so we'll just term limit ourselves, right? Instead of serving 30 or 40 years, we'll just we'll make it 10 years or 12 years. They will never do that. In fact, we've seen attempts at this. Uh, they, they attempted a balanced budget amendment a proposal out of Congress. And you can go watch the video of Congress cheering when they voted that down in the mm. Senate. And so they're never going to do these things if we believe those things are necessary, which I think probably all of your viewers and listeners do. We're going to have to do those things ourselves. But man, Mark, if you did that, if you somehow pulled that back, uh, you're talking about uh, shrinking the size of the federal government by 90 percent, uh, maybe 80 yeah. percent. The military could stay intact, but yep. the non-military portions of the government would shrink radically. Um, what do you what are your thoughts on that? How, how I mean, could we really do that? You bring joy to my heart even saying it, Richard. Yeah, that's <laughs> that is exactly what I intended. You know, people say, well, that, how would you do that? That's impossible, and things would be changed so much. And the reality is, it's not that big of a change. And the reason I say that is because every state does all of these functions already. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're in Colorado, every one of these departments I, I spoke of that we could get rid of at the federal government level, there is an equivalent department in the state of Colorado or That's Texas true. or California or wherever. So all of those functions would simply transfer back to the states where they belonged in the first place. Now, what would happen that would be so transformative is obviously reducing the size and scope of the federal government, but it would also restore federalism, meaning that Colorado could be Colorado, Texas, Texas, California, California. This is what the framers intended, and this is the great safety valve in the American political system. If people think things are really rough right now and we're so divided, Richard, we've always been this way, before the American Revolution, after the American Revolution all the way up through the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, the fights over the Vietnam War. We've been at each other's throats for the entire course of American history, maybe World War II accepted, and it's okay. We're a very diverse people, geographically, religiously, philosophically, ideologically. You can do that in a system of federalism. When you centralize all the power in Washington, D.C., it's like putting all that stuff, all those differences inside a pressure cooker and at some point, the pressure has to be relieved. It's either going to be relieved by the pot exploding, the country coming apart in a very violent way, or we're going to relieve that pressure by going back to federalism. Well, you're, you're talking about um, not an armed revolution, but a, but a legal revolution in yes. a way uh, of restoring America back to uh, what the framers intended. And uh, I think it's a really exciting concept, and uh, I think it would could be uh, just, an, it'd be like a, the dawning of a new age of liberty uh, for not just America, but for the world. Really, if we, if we curtailed the government back to, you know, even the size that it was in 1930, people would absolutely not recognize, uh, recognize the government. I was sitting here thinking uh, about the, the story, the J.R.R. Tolkien story, The Lord of the Rings and the, the ring, uh, the ring loves, you know, it, 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 people love that power, don't they? That centralization of power, that is the spirit of Antichrist. And, and Frodo's journey was to destroy that ring, man. Whatever the <laughs> obstacle, whatever the choice, it had to be thrown into the fires of Mordor. And you're on that quest, man. You're, you're, you're the same, same quest here. And... Uh,